Oh, first John. <laughs> You're lucky I didn't pick the books because this has been a difficult book, but a wonderful book. It's changed me in so many ways. I want us to remember the theme of the book is that Paul wrote in 513. I write these things to you so that you may believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. John is trying to reassure us that we know. Please turn in your Bibles to John 3. 1 John 3. Chapter 3, in the beginning of chapter 3, Jamie reminded us of the great love the Father has for us. Debbie was tasked to teach (laughs) that true believers will not and cannot sin habitually, consistently, and as a way of life. Because sin is, does anyone remember the three things? Incompatible with the law of God, the work of Christ, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We ended last week with a contrast. John says in verse 10, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. There you go. We're up to speed. Let's pray and dig in. Oh, Father God, I stand up here today like the Ethiopian Opian eunuch in my chariot. Lord, he told the Apostle Philip, how will I know, how will I understand what the scriptures mean unless someone teaches us? Here we are, Lord. Please teach us. Thank you, Lord, for the men and women who have poured their lives into the scripture. that help us as teachers to understand so that we can come, Lord, and share what we've gleaned from your word with our sisters, that we all may be strengthened and live lives that honor you. Please, Jesus, speak. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, as we noticed when we read... John is stark in his letter. There's no gray area. He gives black and white. He doesn't want us to guess what the right answer is between many choices. He gives us two broad headings, children of God and the children of the devil. We have trouble with absolutes today. We're bothered by the fact that God only gives us two options. We grade on the curve. Everyone gets a trophy. I'm going to suggest that that's why we have so much trouble with God's word. We want it to say what we want it to say. We're going to see that this isn't new. John will date this struggle between the children of God and the children of the devil back to the beginning of time. Today, we're going to be talking about the mark of a Christian. In his book, The Mark of a Christian, Francis Schaeffer says, for centuries, men have displayed many different symbols to show that they are Christians. They have worn marks on the lapels of their coats, hung chains about their neck, even had special haircuts. But there is a much better sign. At the close of Jesus' ministry, Jesus speaks of his death on the cross, the empty tomb, and his ascension. Knowing he's about to leave, he prepares the disciples for what's to come. Last words are important. In John 13, 33 to 35, Jesus says, My little children, yet a little while I am with you. Me, with you. you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 
Jesus makes clear the distinguishing mark of his followers is our love for one another. Not just in Jesus' era, but for all times in all places until he comes, returns. This is a command that we love one another. This is how God chose to display his glory to the world through his people, a diverse people from every tribe, tongue, and nation loving each other. There is a message our world needs to see and hear today. True Christian love, the proof of the Holy Spirit's work in us. Since this is a command, it could be violated. Remember, Debbie pulled out the mirror last week. I'm still looking at it. <laughs> is it possible for a Christian to be a Christian without showing the mark of loving one another? Spoiler alert, the answer is no. Jesus wants to make sure we bear the mark because the essential characteristic of being a follower of Christ is a deep, sincere love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. As he loved us, so we are to love one another. Let's look at our passage. Please turn John, 1 John 3, 11. For this is a message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, not that he laid down his life for, for us. No, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another, for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Do you see this as a hard passage? I do. Look at all John's contrasts. Love and hate. Life and death. Evil Righteousness, empty words, truth. Look at the words he repeats for emphasis. He says love six times in eight verses. He says brothers six times. He's talking to believers, followers of Christ, about the mark of a Christian, love. John is not talking to the world. John's letter returns over and over to the same three topics, love, obedience, and truth. He assures us in verse 11 this, that this is not a new message. We've been told before that we should love one another. The Old Testament commands, you shall not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. That's Leviticus 19, 18. We learned in 1 John that loving our brothers emphasizes the distinction between light and darkness. Do you still have your flashlights? <laughs> in this section, we're told loving our brothers is a matter of death and life. He who doesn't love his brother abides in death. Brotherly love is the essential mark of a Christian. 
Before what John defines what love is, John defines what love is not through the account of Cain and Abel. Years ago, I went to a play, The Diaries of Adam and Eve. Um, it was written by David Burney. Does anybody know who that is? Meredith Baxter Burney, it was her husband, and he actually acted in it. It was called a comedic drama. I took a friend with me who was not a believer, and it went through the fall of man, which, you know, those, those, those scenes were dramatic, and a humorous view of Adam and Eve's adjustment to life after the fall. During the play, I was struck by the death of Abel. Adam and Eve didn't feel the full impact of their rebellion against God and their desire to know good and evil. They didn't realize the pain of death until one of their children killed the other. I can't imagine. It had such an impact on me. I was sobbing. I looked over at my girlfriend. She was asleep. <laughs> She had no clue. <laughs> Since then, I have been so fascinated with this account. Let's go to Genesis 4 so we can get a, bit, get a better understanding of what John is saying. Genesis 4.1. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel, now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no reward, regard. So Cain was angry, and his face fell. Cain and Abel were brothers. They had the same biological parents. Both brothers brought offerings to God. At first glance, we ask ourselves, why does God accept Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's? Over the years, I've heard so many speculations about the reason God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. I've heard it was the type of sacrifice. I've heard that Cain was an innocent victim of ignorance. Let's go on and see what the word of God says. Verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Already we're seeing this is not about the offering. This is about Cain doing well in God's sight. Because God says if, and that's a big if, if you do well, will you not be accepted? James 14, 17 says, he who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, for him it is sin. Cain went away angry and disappointed. With all the teachers that I'm sure in here, can't you see God returning Cain's paper with the grade of an F on it saying, this needs to be redone? We see God's grace and mercy here. He's warning Cain, you don't need to be upset. You know what is expected in your offering to me. God warned Cain, sin is crouching at the door like a dangerous beast. But he promised Cain, if you obey, you will be like Abel. You will have peace. He had a choice. We have a choice. Remember the Native American story that Debbie told last week? Which dog was Cain feeding? His obedience dog 
or his, I'll worship however I want to, dog. So Cain called his brother into the field and murdered him. Cain murdered his own brother. The verb means to butcher or slaughter. It implies a violent death. He probably slit his brother's throat. John makes it clear that Cain killed Abel because Cain's deeds were evil while his brother's deeds were righteous. Wendy Blight says, Cain chose not to listen to God's words, his warning. Instead, he listened to the voice of the evil one, the one whose mission it is to deceive and lead us into disobedience. John makes this so clear in 3.12 when he says, Cain belonged to the evil one. John MacArthur said, these words denote an aggressive, fervent evil that opposes what is good. God tried to draw Cain back to himself, yet Cain's pride prevented it. He hardened his heart and he refused God's mercy and grace. He refused the opportunity to repent, to listen to God, to change his mind, to obey, and to receive forgiveness. We know from Hebrews 11:4, this side of the cross, why Abel's sacrifice was accepted. It tells us, by faith, Abel offered God a more acceptable sacrifice. By faith, He was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offering. Abel's righteousness revealed Cain's sinfulness. Wendy Blight says, when the world, like Cain, comes face to face with the reality of the one true God, his love and his truth, it can only make one of two decisions. Repent and believe or attempt to destroy the one who is exposing the truth. Why would John warn us not to be like Cain? Because we have the tendency to be like Cain. Why would he warn us not to be led astray in his word? Because we have the propensity to be led astray. Cain is for us an example of the depravity of man, man's sin nature that he was born with, that we were all born with because of the fall. Left to ourselves, we want it our own way, and we don't want anyone to tell us what to do. By nature, we were the devil's children. By grace, We are children of God. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. God's warning to Cain should be our warning to ourselves. Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire, you and you, and you must, as I learned, master it. And it's only through the Holy Spirit, Lord, ladies, Wendy Blight says, when we harbor hatred in our hearts, it infects our hearts with sin. Sin takes root and grows deep. Sin is sin in the eyes of God. It leads to darkness, separating us from intimacy with him. We can't hear his voice or accept his discipline. When we don't walk in the light 
and the love about which John has been teaching, we fall prey to the same emotions spewed from Cain. The saving faith we receive from Jesus transforms our murderous hearts to conform to his heart. Ephesians 2, 4 to 5 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I don't think we will understand or appreciate the sight of heaven, the role our advocate Jesus plays to strengthen us daily, moment by moment, in addition, I'm also thankful that we as believers have the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us in our daily battle with sin. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. We're told in Titus 3.3 that at one time we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our God, the Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. We as believers in Christ have a new heart. It all comes back to our hearts. And we're commanded in Proverbs 4.23 to guard our hearts. We are to be unlike the world. Jesus commanded us and gave us the capacity to love our brothers. In contrast, John throws us, shows us through Cain that the world hates those who belong to God. His righteousness in us reveals their hearts. In Romans 12, 1, Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable for, to God. This is your true and reasonable worship. That's why John warns us, as Jesus did, don't be surprised if the world hates you. We're in good company. Jesus says in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Martin Lloyd-Jones helped me with this. To paraphrase, he says, the difference between Cain and Abel was in Cain, not Abel. Cain, the world, hates Abel, the Christian. Look at Joseph and his brothers. Look at the story of how King Saul hated David and tried to get rid of him. The jealousy, the envy, the malice. Look at the treatment of the prophets. And the supreme example would be the Lord himself. Here is the Son of God in the flesh. Here is eternal life in the flesh. They sneered at him. They picked up stones to stone him. And ultimately, the world crucified the very Son of God who came to save it. The world doesn't hate you because you're hateful. The case of Cain and Abel proves this. The world hates you because you belong to Christ. We have a new family, his family. Like Cain and Abel, 
They see Christ in us. We don't have to say a word. Do you notice Abel is never recorded as saying a word in the scriptures? Yet we know he is the righteous one of the two brothers. This has to be, bring comfort to those of us who live in homes with unbelievers or those who work in a workplace with unbelievers. You are not hated or criticized or ridiculed because you are hateful. Well, at least I hope you're not. <laughs> they hate you because you're his. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 34, don't think I've come to bring peace on earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those in his own household. Become a Christian, live like Jesus, and a man's foes will be those in his own house. And if I just described your household or workplace, please hear this from God's word. It is not your fault. They are fighting a spiritual battle within, a battle for their souls, and it has nothing to do with you. Just love those who God has placed in your circle of influence and leave the salvation to Jesus. And you know, the saints of old show that this is possible. Jesus showed that this is possible. Learn the lesson from Joseph, from David, from the prophets, from Jesus, and they're dealing with those who hated them. They were always loving. We are called to love even those who don't love us back. 1 John 3.14 says, we know that we have passed out of death into life when we love the brothers. This is probably one of my favorite statements in this passage. <laughs> unlike the world, how unlike the world is this? The world goes from life to death. That's the normal progression. Everybody dies. But we as believers are doing the opposite. We have been raised to life from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of love, the kingdom of God forever. Verse 15 says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I don't think anyone in this room has actually murdered anyone. Although I have a confession to make. I love to watch Dateline. <laughs> and I've watched enough to know that you never truly know what's in the heart of sinful men. But what does Jesus say about our anger? Remember the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 21? You have heard it said that You've heard it said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to ju judgment. He even goes on to say, anyone who says to his brother or sister, you fool, is subject to the fires of hell. Jesus links the sin of anger to murder. Ouch. We saw the progression in the heart of Cain. Envy, jealousy, unchecked anger led to Cain's behavior. Are you as uncomfortable as I am? Let's be honest. In our anger, have we murdered someone in our hearts? Have we murdered someone with our words? Unkind words, untrue words, unnecessary words. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no 
opportunity to the devil. Paul leaves room for righteous anger, although I have to say, what percentage of our anger is righteous anger? <laughs> but even righteous anger can lead to bitterness. We have to let anger go. We have to take every thought captive and made it, make it obedient to Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 10.5. We must surrender to him. Romans 12.17 says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Sometimes hatred does far more damage to the hater than anyone else. There are times when we fail in our love towards each other as Christians. And we must go and ask forgiveness. But if perfect obedience were the standard for loving our brothers in Christ, then there would be no Christians. Because all of us fail in numerous ways. But we don't sin habitually, right, Debbie? <laughs> so many of you know I have a new puppy. I have not yet taught him to go to the bathroom with a shovel. I'm still trying. <laughs> He's in the training stage. I got to tell you, as I wrote this, I could hear him banging around in the garage. <laughs> he was pulling stuff down. <laughs> he can't stand still, and he doesn't listen. <laughs> he eats everything, and I am not talking food. Every time I walk in the yard or the garage... I find something new is he, that he's demolished. My husband and I are teasing. We're going, we didn't even know we still had that. <laughs> we don't have it anymore. <laughs> I had a cute little ceramic dog on my front porch. It had a little necklace thing and a bone in its mouth. First I found the, the sign. Then I found the bone. <laughs> he ate the face off the plastic decoration. <laughs> that thing's been on my porch for 20 years. <laughs> My husband was trying to glue it back together, and I told him, just throw it away. <laughs> so it's sitting there. It looks pretty pathetic. <laughs> I'll sneak it in the trash can when he's not looking. <laughs> not to mention, all my potted plants are in ruins. I'll see him out there on top of the pot, just, and I'm like, what is he digging for? <laughs> Frankly, he's a nuisance. But I have resolved in my heart to love that little puppy. I understood who and what he was when I got him. And I still just adore him. This made me think of how people treat their animals today. You know, I went to the swap meet in um, Rose Bowl there were more baby strollers with dogs in them <laughs> than children. And people stop and talk to other people's dogs and totally ignore other people's kids. <laughs> we live in a wacky world. <laughs> this made me think, can I offer the same kind of love and acceptance and patience to the people in my life as I do my sweet little puppy? Can I learn to love others like my Savior loves me with grace? So I have to ask myself, am I rightly loving others as the Lord, as the Lord has asked of me? I think this passage causes us another look in the mirror, the mirror of his word. We need to examine ourselves. Do we see the mark? God warns about intentional, habitual bouts of anger and hatred because it's inconsistent with the righteousness he has given us. As with everything, it comes back to our hearts. Outward obedience is not enough. God desires sacrificial, loving, and giving he asks us to give up one thing our own way and receive something greater, his way, eternal life. He wants our whole heart. 
Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to live at peace with all men and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Earlier, John contrasted light and darkness to help us understand the Christian life. Here, he's contrasting love and hatred. No one who hates lives in God, but the one who lives in God will love. The antidote to hatred is love. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. I love that in the providence of God, because remember when this is written, there were no numbers, <laughs> that this is so like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus also said in John 15, 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. God commands us to love. God's love should be the standard of our love for others. Can John just say one thing that's easy? God calls us to love like he loves. John also points out that love is not a feeling. Love is a choice that causes action. Love will be displayed in acts of service that go beyond words. John says we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. There's a quote on giving, but I thought it was appropriate here because it points to love in action. Begrudging giving says, I have to. Dutiful giving says, I need to. But thankful giving says, I want to. I want to love like Jesus commands me to love, even when it's inconvenient. Wearsby says, self-preservation is the first law of physical life, but self-sacrifice is the first law of a spiritual life. Remember the question, who's my neighbor? It's very similar to the question Cain asks. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. Jesus confirmed that with the parable of the Good Samaritan. You studied that in your homework. I hope today at your tables you go over that parable. The best part is that our love for one another speaks volumes to a dying world. This reminded me of Teresa Stockton. Some of you will remember her. For those of you who don't, know, who don't know her, she is a believer who attended Grace Chapel. I'll call her over 50. <laughs> She'll like that. <laughs> She's blind, and her husband died suddenly, which left her without help. And then she realized her guide, guide dog was going blind also. Without her husband there, I used to tell Dennis, that dog is not a guide dog. He leads her right over bushes. <laughs> it was because her husband had, had interceded between the two. He was guiding both of them. But when he was gone, she could no longer take care of a blind dog. It was time for the dog to retire. Two big losses in one month. Her biological family didn't live here. And because of health reasons, couldn't come here to help. She had no idea what she was going to do. She thought she was going to be destitute. She literally couldn't see to find the solution. The body of Christ 
came alongside her. The Lord brought first one person and then another from her family here who loved on her to go through her things. What does paper mean to someone who's blind? How would you know what anything is? To sell her things, pack what she needed, sort her mail, do her taxes. Her husband had been sick for a long time to find the insurance and retirement that she needed and finally move her to Oregon to be with her sister. And it was all done, not for attaboys, but because she was our sister and we dearly loved her. She was dearly loved by her Christ-following family. One beautiful result was that her sister in Oregon saw how the love of Christ was expressed to Teresa in more than words. At first, she was skeptical of this church that was going to go through all her things. (laughs) But she had no choice but to trust. This had such an impact on her. In Galatians 6.10, Paul tells believers, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially the household of faith. Another woman who was trying to help Teresa had been told about Jesus for years, and it never made a difference. By witnessing the love of believers, I mean, people were coming from everywhere. Caring for Teresa motivated her to trust him. I remember her telling me, I've never seen anything like this in my life. She saw the hands and feet of Jesus, and they became real to her. That's God's plan. So that they may see our good works and give glory to God. I also thought of this verse the other day. I brought my my mother-in-law. I take care of her. She's 96. Never underestimate the power of a kind word. Just when people stop and look her face to face, she's in a wheelchair, and speak to her and encourage her. I brought her here for a funeral and I saw so much love expressed to her. I mean, I took her home, she can't walk, but she had a skip in her step. (laughs) There are so many women in this body of believers in this room, I could go table to table, I see at every table. People who I've seen express love to others because of his love expressed to them. It pours out, it overflows. But I'm going to warn you, Christian love can be messy. Sometimes we're going to get dirty. It can be sacrificial. It might cost us. And not only from our resources, but also from our time. Time It's one of our only non-renewable resources. But it speaks volumes when we're willing to lay it down in obedience to our Lord's command to care for or listen to someone in need. Christian love can be inconvenient. Sometimes we want to look the other way. I have too much on my plate. Or that person is difficult. (laughs) Although we don't always have to be the one, pray about that. But when we get dirty, when we sacrifice, when we lay aside our own convenience for others, is when we look the most like Jesus to a lost and hurting world. And trust me, the world is watching us. What would happen if we loved the way Jesus calls us to love? Agape, self-sacrificial. The kind of love the Father had for us when he sent his Son to save us. Would living in love help us to give sacrificially? Would it prompt us to pray for those who hurt us? Would it allow us to extend forgiveness 
to those who we really don't think deserve forgiveness? Would it stop us from having the last snarky word in a disagreement? Oh my gosh, did I write that? (laughs) That's a little revealing. (laughs) Would it give us patience with others who are just recovering sinners like we are? The fruit of God's spirit in us is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't know about you, but he's changed my heart. I have love for people that I didn't even like before. (laughs) We can't allow ourselves to miss the opportunities God places in our paths, to bring our hardened hearts to him through repentance and restoration, and then to accept one of the best things he offers from his hands, an opportunity to express his love through us. Or as John said, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Though not one word is recorded in the scriptures from the mouth of Abel, yet his faith and obedience speak loud and clear even today. Oh, let's pray. Father God, I pray that as we study your word, we will ask ourselves, do we bear the mark? John wrote this so that we would know that we have eternal life. He wrote this so that we would know that we are his followers. I pray, Lord, that any of us who see that what we do and say and think and the way we act is not exactly in line with what John has written. And Lord, these passages are difficult for all of us, but we know our way back. We, Lord, are not going to ignore your warnings. Lord, please change us. This isn't a list of do's and don'ts, but this is love that spills out from us to a lost and dying world. The love you've poured into us, Lord, is all we have to give. Lord, help us. Help us to hold up the mirror of your word so that we may reflect your glory and by it that others will be changed. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.